Y'all ready to get into the Word this morning? Are you excited about the Word? Hallelujah. Man, that blesses me. When I hear testimonies of what God has done and is doing, it just blesses me so much because I know that you're working the Word. If you'll work the Word, the Word will work for you. Amen? Say it out loud. If I work the Word, the Word will work for me. Tell your neighbor, say, the Word will work for you as well as it will work for anyone else. If you will work it. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, we used to not, we, we was talking about, you know, the, the sower sowing the word, which we understand that it was, Jesus was using that parable to explain that you have to sow the word of God into your heart, the soul of your heart, right? And that soul has got to be broken up. Well, that seed is planted in there, and then that seed begins to produce and begins to, to bring forth accordingly based on what you sowed in it, right? Well, folks, let me tell you something. This is true in every area of life. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap, praise God. So really, it's up to you whether you have supernatural increase. It's up to you whether you have divine help. It really is. It's up to you whether you have peace and joy. It's not up to God. Go with me to Mark chapter 5, and let's read verses uh, 25 through 34. Mark 5, verse 25, the Bible says, And a certain woman which had 12 years, she had suffered many things of many positions, had spent all that she had, was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, everybody say, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? He looked around about to see her that had done this thing, but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now today, we're continuing in our series of Miracles on Demand. This is part seven. I told you, and uh, that if you still got the notes, you can put them up there for those that might not have been here. We're not going to go over it again. But number one, you got to have the God kind of faith. You got to have the faith of God. Remember Mark chapter 11, we read it last week where Jesus talked about, he spoke to the fig tree. Peter noticed the next day that the fig tree that Jesus had spoken to was dried up from the roots and Jesus had said, have faith in God. The Greek says have the God kind of faith or have the faith of God. And then I shared with you number two, how critical it is that every one of us learns how that the kingdom of God operates. You need to learn how the kingdom of God operates. I'm telling you folks, it's just like going to a new country, a different country. If you go to some countries and drive on the same side of the road as you drive here, you're going to get in trouble. Amen? You may have a wreck. You may get pulled over and locked up. They may be think you're drunk for driving on the wrong side of the road. Yeah, but I'm driving on the right side. Well, we don't drive on the right side here. We drive on the left side. You got to learn the laws of that country, of that kingdom, right? right? Same thing is true. You were brought out of the kingdom of darkness. You were delivered from that, brought into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God doesn't operate in the kingdom of darkness. Satan is the God of this world, this world system. You grew up in a world system. And as bad as I hate to say it, many of our parents taught us a lot of stuff. Even though they meant well, they loved us did not agree with the kingdom of God and how it works. Many of us were taught, save and rake and scrape. That is the kingdom of darkness philosophy. That didn't come from God. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, give and it'll be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give it to your bosom. Now, here we find, and I, let, me, let me say this to you before I go any further to number three because we didn't get to number three last week, but I want to get to it in just a moment. But I told you that, you know, I don't want to just experience supernatural increase and blessings and favor for myself and our children and their children. I want every one of you to experience it. 
I want you as we sing and experience the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. Amen? The goodness of God. Think about that. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's the goodness of God that causes people to think differently. God is dealing with your heart. Why do you think that way? Why do you talk that way? Why did you do that? I'm trying to get your attention. I want you to experience my blessings and have victory in your life. But folks, let me tell you something. One of the first things you've got to do is you've got to get in agreement with heaven. I mean, you've got to come into that place. That's what faith is. You are fully persuaded that what God says is truth and you are in agreement with God. I'm trying to say things in some ways a little different to help you grasp what faith is all about. Faith is a substance, a supernatural substance. And it goes to work. When you hear the word and you believe the word and you act on the word, it's released from your heart out of your mouth. And it begins to attack your lack. It begins to attack sickness and disease and problems in your life. Everybody, would, if it would only hear me and listen to what God is saying, they could turn their life around. They could have supernatural turnaround. It wouldn't take that long. I do know that the Bible talks about increase and how it comes little by little. But what that means is simply this. As you're going to hear what some of the things I'm going to share with you this morning, even about my own life. You may not. There is scriptures where the prophet said, by this time tomorrow. I mean, God can do something so miraculous by this time tomorrow. Everything's changed. But even if it doesn't happen by this time tomorrow, that doesn't mean that God's not working. There's a scripture in Proverbs that talks about increase coming little by little. And I learned a long time ago that God's supernatural increase keeps pace with your integrity. It keeps pace with your confession. It keeps pace with your faith. Amen? A lot of people, if God was to bless them by this time tomorrow, where all their bills are paid and the house is paid off and they got all the money they want, you wouldn't see them in church anymore. Why? Because they hadn't developed the character of Christ. Amen? You think God's gonna be a part of something that's gonna destroy you? Did you know that uh, prosperity is the destruction of a fool? The fool said there is no God. He said in his heart there is no God. Or God didn't give him this. And God wasn't responsible for all this. And it leads him to destruction. Now, number three, faith is released through your mouth. Now, we know Jesus spoke to the tree. And you have to speak to your mountain. You've got to speak to your body. You've got to speak to your finances. You've got to speak to your problem. Speak to your marriage. Speak to any problem that's going on in your life. Speak the word. God said, my word will not return to be void. It accomplished what I sent it to do. What did he send it to do? He sent his word and it healed them, the Bible says. He sent his word and it healed them. God sent his word and it saved us. Is that right? So you gotta start talking to things. Teach your children to talk to it. Teach your children not to curse it, but to bless. Amen? Amen? Oh, my goodness. I was just thinking this morning uh, how far God has brought me and where God brought me from. We just read about this woman in Mark chapter 5. In verse 28, the Bible says she said, if you will look at in Matthew, uh, Matthew tells about this saying, it says she kept saying. The Greek says she said it over and over. She kept saying to herself, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Hallelujah. Now, why? She'd heard the reports of, and she'd heard the testimonies of Jesus' healing power. She'd heard about the miracles that he'd done. So you know what she did? She started saying something. I'm telling you, in every situation, especially in crisis, the first word out of your mouth determines the outcome. Everybody better listen to what I'm telling you. Imagine your child falling in a pool and you find that child who's been in the bottom of that pool for five minutes. The first words out of your mouth will determine whether that child will live or die, will have brain damage or not. The first words out of your mouth. If we have time, more testimonies, I can tell you some testimonies that I know of personally where that very thing happened. 
You've got to be ready, folks. You've got to have the word of God in your heart and your mouth. You don't have time to go get your Bible and start looking up scriptures when there's an emergency. You've got to know that I will say, he shall not die, she shall not die, but shall live and declare the works of the Lord. Amen? Glory to God. Now, that word she said, is the word said is lego, L-E-G-O. If you look the word up, it means a systematic set discourse. A systematic set discourse. Everybody say this out loud. When I say, when I say anything, anything, that word say, that word say means lego, lego, which are building blocks for my life. It is a set, set systematic systematic discourse. discourse. Now, I am accused a lot of being over people's heads. So let's talk about what does that mean, a set, systematic discourse. If you buy a box of Legos, it is a set, systematic discourse. It would only fit together like a puzzle one way. If you put it together according to the manufacturer's instructions, it will look exactly like the picture on the box when you finish. If you use the set systematic discourse of God's word, the way that it was intended to be used by the creator at the end of your faith, the situation will look exactly like the word of God says it's supposed to look. By whose stripes you were healed. You will look and feel and be absolutely healed in your body. It works the same in every area of life. Now Wednesday night, I happened to get up for some reason, I don't even know why. Why I got into it, it was not in my notes. But I got to talking and somebody asked me about this and said, you need to talk about this a little bit more. I got to talking about a chronic way of thinking. What does chronic mean? Chronic means long continuous, long lasting. The covenant that I just read to you about a few minutes ago is an everlasting covenant. God is chronic in his thinking. God does not think one way a thousand years ago and another way a thousand years later. God is chronic in his way of thinking. When you are in a chronic way of thinking, long-lasting, continuous, the same, people have chronic headaches. I was in Peru and there was a woman when I was in Peru who had chronic headaches years and years and years. I laid hands on her, she was healed. You can imagine the joy that her and her husband had because nothing could help her. Long lasting, continuous. That's part of the curse. Read Deuteronomy 28. Long continuous, a sickness and disease, chronic. People have a chronic way of thinking. When you have a chronic way of thinking, you're in a creative mode. As a man thinketh, so is he. You're opening the door by your thoughts. You're opening the door by the way you think. Whether you can be wealthy, whether you can be healthy, whether you can have joy and peace and good marriage, bless children, live in victory, or, listen to me, by that chronic way of thinking, you may continue to live under the curse. There's a lot of people who live under the curse even though they're born again. They might not be under the curse of spiritual death. They're not because they've been born again. They pass from death into life. But y'all listen to me. We were singing about being redeemed this morning, right? Galatians 3, 13 says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. What is the curse of the law? Let me break it down for you. Spiritual death, that means you are lost in sin. You are separated from God. But most of us here, at least, I think everybody's born again. You're not separated from God. You're one with the Lord now. You have eternal life. His life, his spirit lives on the inside of you. You have a relationship with God, right? But yet, he redeemed us from more than just spiritual death. He redeemed us from sickness and disease. The Bible says in Matthew eight seventeen, 
himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, by whose stripes you were healed. A lot of people that are saved still have sickness and disease. Why? Because they are ignorant of that fact. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Their mind has not been renewed. Therefore, they have the old chronic way of thinking. It's been that way all their life. Why? Because they inherited it from their ancestors. But did you know that Peter said you've been redeemed from that no good, empty way of life passed down to you by your ancestors, your fathers and grandfathers? Huh? Yes. Did you know that? You've been redeemed from that way? But you know what? It's up to you to break free from it. See, if you still think the sickness and disease is a part of life, and I'm going to get it because everybody else has got it, and I was in the room with somebody that had it, therefore I've got to have it as well, well, you're going to get it. Right? Like the woman she was talking, the, the person she was talking about. Everybody's going to get it. No, they're not. Everybody's not. That's, right. That's like saying, because you had a chronic way of thinking about sin passed to you by your parents and grandparents in the church you grew up in, where everybody sins. Well, that makes you feel better, doesn't it? <laughs> well, if you're sinning and you're sinning and you're sinning and you're sinning, well, then... I don't feel so bad about it because everybody else is doing it too. So I'm just joining the club. That is a chronic way of thinking that is contrary to God's thinking. Because God says you've been made free from sin. You've been set free from sin. You don't have to sin. I write unto you that you sin not, the Bible says. Y'all getting this? Just because Christ redeemed you from it doesn't mean that you're free from it because you have not accepted your freedom yet. Listen, not only did he redeem you from spiritual death and sickness and disease, but he redeemed you from poverty. He redeemed you from lack. But you cannot, listen, you cannot be transformed from something that you have conformed to. The chronic way of thinking of poverty and lack and barely getting by from paycheck to paycheck, that is a chronic way of thinking that continues to create lack and need in your life. So how do I get past it? I'm glad you asked. Are we going to get that part? This woman had been suffering 12 years. It was chronic. It was a chronic disease. She went to the doctor, spent all of her money. She's still hemorrhaging. She's losing blood. She's getting worse. She's got a chronic way of thinking. Can you break out of that pattern? Amen. Is it possible for you or for me, for anyone to break out of that pattern of the way you've been thinking about yourself, about your life, about your family, about your body, your mind, your finances, your marriage, your relationship? Can you break out of it? Yes, yes you can. She did it. You know how she did it? It started by what she heard. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you will hear what the spirit of God is saying today, how can I tell the difference, pastor, between just hearing with my natural ears and hearing what the spirit of God is saying? If all you hear is what I say, you will not think about it again this week. But if you hear what the spirit of God is saying, you will be thinking about it. You will be meditating on it. You will be talking about it. You will be asking questions. You'll be marking your Bible. You'll be writing down notes. You'll be running references. You'll be finding books that apply to that situation in your life. You're hearing what God is saying. And God is saying, I want to help you. I want to bring you out so that I can bring you in. That's what he did with the children of Israel. He brought them out brought them out of Egypt to bring them in to the promised land. Amen? Hallelujah. Remember, faith is released through your mouth. This woman said, you know why? She said what she did because she believed. She believed that those things which she said shall come to pass. Hallelujah. You know, uh, look in your Bibles to Proverbs 66, verse 12. Proverbs 66, verse 12. I don't know if we'll get to another one of my notes or not. Proverbs 66, verse 12. 
How many here have been through some hard times? Raise your hand if you've ever been through a hard time. Come on now. Well, I'm glad. I'm going to go back here and sit with some of you folks that ain't never been through a hard time. I'm going to let you preach. Which one of you didn't raise your hand never been through a hard time? Because I want y'all to take my place. I'm going to sit down. I've been through some hard times. I can tell you something else. And y'all know, y'all know that daddy loves you, right? Amen. Come on now, you don't have a whole lot of spiritual fathers. You've got a bunch of teachers, but I love you. I love you too much that you sit there and nod off and, you know, let you just mind, just daydream all over the place. They was about half of you. You didn't even know I asked a question just then. Your mind was on something else. You didn't, you didn't not respond because you didn't want to. You didn't even know what I said. Come on now. Huh? What is that? Oh, Psalm, sorry. Thank you. Psalm 66, verse 12. Hallelujah. I need all the help I can get. How many of you have ever been through a hard time in your life? Guess what? Israel went through some hard times. But guess what? Most of it they brought on themselves. That's the reason Proverbs said people do stupid things and they want to blame the Lord. People do stupid stuff and then they, and they ruin their life then they want to blame God. Why did God allow this to happen to me? Did he stop doing that? Let no man say when he's tested, when he's tempted and tried that God did it. For God doesn't tempt, test, or try no man. Right? Come on now. The psalmist said, God, thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. You know why he caused men to ride over their heads? because of their sin and their rebellion. I was thinking about Israel just yesterday. How that God told them and warned them for hundreds and hundreds of years through the prophets that if they did not stop rebelling against him, turning to other gods, that he was going to scatter them throughout the entire world. If for no other reason an atheist should be able to trace what God said through the years, watch what God said, look at what God has done in the nation of Israel alone, and know that he is God. Yes. He prophesied it over and over and over, but yet they would not heed, and what happened? They were scattered to the four corners of the earth just like God said they would. They were no longer a nation. But then, in 1948, in a day, in one day, just like God prophesied through Isaiah, they became a nation again. God brought them from all over the world and put them right back in the land that he promised Abraham. And the people who are Orthodox Jews know that they have an everlasting covenant with Almighty God. And the people who know the word of faith who are washed in the blood of Jesus know that we also are the same as the natural descendants of Abraham we are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. We have been washed in the blood. We belong to Christ. Therefore, we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the covenant, according to the promise. I have just as much right to be a multimillionaire or a billionaire as any Jew on the face of this earth. Amen. Well, can God? That's what got them in trouble. When they begin to say, can God furnish a table? Come on now. Look at your neighbor. Say, can God make you into a millionaire? Can God make me into a millionaire? Now answer him. You should answer with a bold yes. Now look at him and say, God can. And God will. If you will believe and obey him. Listen to me, folks. You can get an idea. I don't even remember how I come across this man. But uh, down in Georgia, just a regular, everyday farmer, but he was different than most of the farmers. He was a believer. He was a tither. He went to a Word of Faith church. And one day, just like God gave you that idea at work, God gave him an idea of a part to go on the back of the tractor, something to do with the plow and stuff, turned him into a millionaire just like that. He found somebody to help him make, make it, you know, and just like that. A big company, John Deere, somebody bought it, became a millionaire, just like that. Isn't that something? What God can do. Just like that. God can give you a picture and you just wake up and start drawing and start writing and start taking notes. But most people, they want to sit there. Sit on the couch. Amen? Just sit there. 
That's the stomach turns and all them pictures, those soap operas my mama used to watch. I had a name for all of them back then. Huh? All my stupid children. Come on now. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'd say, Mama, you want to watch that mess? I told her, even I got grown, I was preaching. I'd, I'd walk, come to her house and walk in. She, went, she knew I was coming. She'd turn it off. <laughs> and I'd walk in. She'd watch the soap opera. I said, Mama, why are you watching that? Oh, Eddie, you know, I just, I just, I don't believe none of that stuff. I said, why are you watching it for then? <laughs> Sit there and cry when somebody die. <laughs> I'm not kidding y'all. One pastor had a woman call him crying asking him to pray for so-and-so, and he said, who are you talking about? And she called the woman's name. He said, I don't know her. You know, she plays on, and she called the name of the soap opera. She thought it was real. <laughs> yeah. That's the reason Proverbs said people do stupid things, ruin their lives, and then they blame God. Yeah. Amen? Right. Hallelujah. <laughs> so God said, they went through fire, they went through water. Yeah. But, everybody say but. but. Hallelujah. I like this because it changed the scenery right here. This but changes the scenery of everything, right? That's what Jerry Savelle said this morning. He said, don't forget the buts because it changes the scenery. Yeah. But thou brought us out, us out into a what? Wealthy a wealthy what? Wealthy. A wealthy place. Anybody remember the Hebrew word translated wealthy place? Revaya. Revaya, R-E-V-A-Y-A-H, Revaya. It means runneth over. David said, my cup, what? Revaya, runneth over, same word. My cup runneth over. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lie. I don't want for anything. You ought to be, listen to me. I know some of y'all listen to Jesse and probably just get so mad you can't stand it. I love listening to Jesse because he exalts the Lord. Started with nothing. First offering he got was a Dr. Pepper. But you know what? He didn't get discouraged. He didn't whine and cry and moan. He drove as far as he could in the car to the, to the, headed to the next place he was supposed to preach. And in the middle of the night, broke down because he had no gas, rolled into a station there. Just rolled up to that single pump there and standing there praying and just waiting. See what God's going to do. No money. Hadn't eaten in days. Got a Dr. Pepper. He said, I still got it today. Never did open it. That was his first pay. That was his first offering from a church. And a man pulls in in a truck. They start, he said, you go ahead. No, Jesse said, yo, you go ahead. And so he struck up a conversation. What you doing out here in the middle of the night? Well, Jesse wound up having to tell him that he had preached. He said, where did you preach? And he told him, he said, that's the town I live in. And what church was it? He told him he knew about the church, didn't he? And he started cussing. <laughs> Jesse said he was a cussing angel. <laughs> you mean tell me you preached at that church and he didn't give you an offering? And went to cussing and pulled out a big old wad of money and gave him $700. Come on. What year did I tell y'all that was in? 1970-something. Huh? 50-something, wasn't it? 70, yeah, 77. Gave him $700. The man in the store comes out and said, I got a bunch of popcorn here. You want some of this? And that guy said, you go in there and get whatever you want. Now, gave him $700. But now here's Jesse. Jesse's like, Lord's my shepherd. I don't want for anything. I don't lack for nothing. Why? Because he's my shepherd. Is he your shepherd? Yes. Is he not just as much your shepherd as he is Jesse's? Yes. Or Jerry's or Kenneth's or anybody else's? He's your shepherd? Does the shepherd love them more than he loves you? Does the shepherd have favorite sheep? No. Come on now. You do understand that if he was a crooked shepherd, he'd have favorite ones. And he'd show favoritism. But he's straight. He's straight as an arrow. Hallelujah. They're crooked under-shepherds and pastors of churches, and they show favoritism. I've had people get mad at me about it because they gave more money than most people and wanted me to show them favoritism, and they wanted to have a say-so and try to tell me what I should do. And I let them know real quick, like, I treat everybody the same. Jesus is Lord. He's the chief shepherd of the church. I'm his under-shepherd. Amen. I only say what he tells me to say and do what he tells me to do. Amen. And if they don't like it, they can just go. And a lot of them went. Amen. Amen. Because they didn't like it. I want you to know God loves you just as much as he loves me or anybody else. Right. He'll do the same for you that he's done for anybody else. I'm telling you, he'll bless you. Yes. 
Listen to me. He'll give you a whole chain of shops. Glory to God. You hear what I'm saying to you? He'll give you new ideas. He'll give you new businesses. You'll be an entrepreneur for God. A millionaire with an H-E-I-R on the end of it. An heir of God. A joint heir of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, the NASB says a place of abundance. The NLT says you brought us to a place of great abundance. You know, years ago, I wrote in my Bible, in the front of this Bible right here. Somebody's already claimed this one. The rest of you kids, you just have to be, I don't know what you have to do, but you, <laughs> one of them claimed this one. And I wrote in the front of my Bible, is, listen to this, prosperity part of the gospel. Put Matthew 11, 5 up there. I want everybody to see it. You write it down. Mark your Bible. John's disciples asked, are you the one who was to come? Should we look for another, expect a different one? He said, go tell John what you hear and see. The blind, see, lame, walk, lepers, heal, deaf, hear, dead, or raised. And, everybody say and. Amen. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Remember Luke 4, 18 and 19? Jesus read out Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He said, anointed me to what? Preach the gospel to who? Preach the gospel to who? To the poor. Hallelujah. Listen to me. I'm still talking about faith being released through your mouth, through the words that come out of your mouth. The good news to the poor is this. You don't have to be poor no more. The Amplified Classic of verse 19 says, to proclaim the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and the free favor of God profusely abound. Profusely. What does profusely mean? Pouring forth liberally, extravagantly, uh, bountifully to a great degree in large amounts, excessively exhibiting great abundance. Amen. Jesus said, I couldn't have preached that to you, to all the people. Amen? Amen? Jesus said, I'm anointed to preach prosperity. And as humble as I can say it to y'all, listen to me. God has anointed me to preach prosperity to the poor. Amen. To anybody who will receive it. Yes. Back up Psalm 65, verse 11. Psalm 65, verse 11. Because how many of you know that there's still a lot left for this year? On, Don't wait till next year. Glory. Quit putting off. <laughs> Quit putting things off. Faith is now. Faith is right now. Thou crown us a year with what? Goodness. With your goodness. And your paths drop what? Fatness. Everybody say fatness. fatness. Oh, my goodness, my goodness. Fatness, the word, Hebrew word, the shin means abundance. Orthodox Jewish Bible says your paths drip with plenty. The web says your carts overflow with abundance. God's word translation, richness overflows wherever you are. Is he here? Richness overflows wherever God is. Is he with you? Yes. Didn't he say I'll be with you always? Yes. Richness overflows everywhere he goes. Yes. Amen? Amen? I said richness overflows everywhere. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, God is good. Mm-mm-mm. Yes. Now, I'm just telling y'all right now, I'm expecting the anointing to prosper to get on somebody today. Yes. I'm expecting the anointing to prosper to get on somebody. Yes. Who's it gonna get on? Yes. Who's gonna allow the anointing to prosper to get on them? Yes. Amen? Yes. Do y'all realize how much money is out there in the world? I don't have time to go into that right now, but let me just tell you right, that, right now. The problem is most of us with the world. We're in it, but we're not of it. Amen. Amen? And God wants to get it in our hands. So let's just keep this thing real, okay? Now, I grew up poor as everybody knows. You've heard my testimony. You know I grew up very poor. Holes in the floor, no indoor plumbing. Uh, my dad was poor. As far as I know, his parents were poor and probably his parents. I don't know how far back it goes. But I know it goes way back. We grew up in Wilcox County. My wife and I both grew up in Wilcox County. There's 159 counties in Georgia. With, this is to be careful, with one being the wealthiest county and 159 being the poorest county, Wilcox is listed as 156. There's only three counties poor in the entire state of Georgia than Wilcox County where we grew up. The average per capita is $13,000.
uh, the average household salary is 31000 a year. Average household salary in, jo in Wilcox County, 31000 a year. Huh? Y'all were way above average. Yeah, y'all were way above average. People that worked at the, at the base, they were way above average everybody else. Her, parent, her, her, her dad and uh, others that he rode with worked at the Warner Robins Air Force Base, same place that uh, Brandis's mom and dad worked at. Now, listen, God wanted to change some things because, you know, I can relate to people being poor. We lived in an old house, like I said, no, no glass panes in the windows, drew water from the well, and so uh, my dad just drove old junk pickup trucks, you know. He was a pup wooder for a long time, and then he tried other things, and no matter how hard he worked, we're still working, he was still, we were still poor because he was under a curse. He wasn't saved. We didn't go to church. Didn't know nothing about the Word of God. Knew nothing about the, the blessing of the Lord. But now listen to me. I want y'all to understand something. I was headed in the same direction. I was headed in the same direction. Thank God for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Cycles. Everybody say cycles. cycles. I, want, I, want, I want everybody to get a hold of this. I'm going to walk around so I can get everybody's attention. Everybody say cycles. cycles. Say cycles run in families from generation to generation. Now what kind of cycle runs in your family? Are there divorces from one generation to the next? Is there cancer? People dying from a certain disease from one generation to the next? Was there poverty that went from one generation to the next like it was in my family? It can be a lot of things. It can be addiction. Alcohol and drug addictions running from one family to the next one. It can be a lot of things. See I was heading that direction. But thank God, the cycle was broken. Now, a lot of people say, well, God broke it for you. God couldn't break it unless I got in agreement with him. God couldn't break that cycle if I didn't get in agreement with him. I had to use my faith. Once I heard the word and I got into the word of faith and I began to understand how the word of faith works, believing with your heart, saying with your mouth, acting on the word, obeying the word. No, I had to get in agreement with him or I'd have never got free from it. Amen? Now, what does Proverbs 10, 22 say? The blessing of the Lord. What does it do? Ask your neighbor, what does the blessing of the Lord do? Answer. Do you know what the blessing of the Lord would do? Huh? What would the blessing of the Lord do for you? What did it do for Jesse? What did it do for Jerry Seville? What did it do for all robbers? What would it do for you, Russell? What would it do for you? Come on. What would it do for you, Debbie? Come on, back here. Would it do the same thing for you? Huh? What about you? Would it do the same for you? What would it do for you? It'll make you rich. And listen to me, on top of that, let's put the cherry on top. He had no sorrow with it. You don't have to kill yourself doing it. You don't have to lose your family while you're doing it. You can enjoy life. He gave us all things liberally to enjoy, Timothy said. Paul told Timothy, all things liberally to enjoy. Are you enjoying it? Are you enjoying life? Yes. See, a lot of people, they allow the devil to deceive them. They think that they're not enjoying life if they're not partying. If they're not having sex, if they're not drinking alcohol or doing drugs, if they're not listening to some old filthy, ungodly music, watching ungodly movies, hanging out with wicked people, they think they're not having fun. God says, listen to me, I gave you all this stuff liberally, extravagantly to enjoy it. And in case any of you young people especially, older people, you ought to hardly know. You done tried it got a t-shirt, everything. And you know. They lied to you. Somebody told you a lie. Because you ever woke up with a hangover, you know what I'm talking about, throwing your guts out. It's not fun. Amen? In the world full with drama, fussing and fighting with your husband, your wife, your children. Come on, folks. And besides all that, the sorrow that comes piling on top of divorces and loss of children, loss of lives and poverty and sickness and disease. Well, just know this. God doesn't want you to be poor. God wants you to be blessed. He wants you saved, healed, whole, full of peace and joy. Amen? Amen. 
Yeah, my dad said he was cursed. He knew he was cursed. I don't know how he knew it, but he said it all the time. I feel like I'm under a curse. You know what one of my dad's favorite songs was? And he could not sing a lick. He'd try sometime. I mean, he literally could not carry a tune. I mean, he didn't even say, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. He literally couldn't, but he'd try to sing it, and so he'd get mom or somebody else to sing it for him. But one of his favorite songs was this old guy, you young people won't remember him, Tennessee Ernie Ford. How many people remember Tennessee Ernie Ford? His number one hit, 16 tons and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. My dad bought everything on debt. My dad bought everything on debt. My dad lived. I believe my dad was born in debt. I know he died in debt. I believe he was born in debt. That's all he knew. Amen? I got to think about this this morning while I was getting ready. I love some of the, I just really love, love, love the things that God gives me when I don't have time to jot them down because I'm trying to get everything in my last minute, you know, trying to get everything, get my tie and make sure my hair is straight and all this kind of stuff. And he starts talking to me. And he said, you know them trees you was talking about the other night? And I said, yes, sir. He said, let me tell you about two trees. He said, I planted two trees in the garden. One was a tree of life. He said, the other one was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I told Adam not to eat of that tree. But the devil deceived Eve. Adam went along with it. And what happened? They ate of that tree, and people are still eating from one of those trees or the other to this day. I said, what? He said, people are still eating from one of those trees to this day. He said, I said in my word that the healing of the tongue is a tree of life. Are you eating from it? I'm like, whoa, glory to God. The healing of the tongue is a tree of life. I am eating from the tree of life every time I point my tongue in the direction that God says to say, I am blessed. I am blessed. You sit here right now. You can do with that woman. When he puts his hand on my head, I will be whole. When he touches me, I will be delivered. Amen. My blood pressure will become normal as soon as lands laid on me. When I sow this seed, I will receive. Amen. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, folks. There's a lot of people. The trees that were planted by their families are still producing fruit in their children and grandchildren's lives because they never dug up the roots. So they're still eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It brought the curse. Well, thank God. I said, you know what? Enough's enough. I'm not having that no more. Yeah, I know what it's like to be poor. I, I, I'll never forget that winter of 1963, 64. Hardest winter we ever had in South Georgia. Eight years old. Dad had been hit by a drunk. Laid up in the bed. Couldn't get out of the bed. My mama told my brother and I, he was nine, I'm eight. We had fireplaces. Every room in the house, but the kitchen had old wood stove. It was freezing cold. She said, y'all got to take the wagon and the axe and go down in the woods, cut wood. So we're down there in the woods. We're cutting. Hands freezing. Can't even feel your fingers, feel your toes. Everything's so cold. And I remember. Any of y'all ever seen that old movie, Gone with the Wind? Huh? Y'all remember that? Scarlet O'Hara. It was made, supposed to be about during the Civil War. And, uh, you know, in the clip, you see her. She walks out there. She barely can hardly move, you know. She's so hungry. She walks out there and she finds a turnip, I believe it was, down in the ground. She starts digging it up. And she grabs that turnip and she stands, she takes a bite of it and she stands up and she said, as God is my witness, I'm going to live through this. When it's all over, I'll never be hungry again. Yes. Well, that's the way I felt that day. I said, one day I'm getting out of this. I'm never coming back to it. One day I'm leaving this. I'm leaving it all behind me. I will never be poor. I will not live the way my parents, my grandparents have lived. I'm telling you folks, that woman that we read about, she said, and she got what she said. Amen? Amen. Well, I graduated from high school, left home in the old 1964 Fort Fairlane, got a job as a Mason's helper, 
Turned 18 years old, got a, drive, a job driving a propane gas truck, bringing home $110 a week. Now listen to me. I have got saved. I started tithing. I'm living by myself. I got this Cracker Jack box, my daddy called it, that I lived in. It was a 10 by 40 trailer. Real, real old, run down. Fixed it up best I could. But I'm, I'm reading my Bible, and I'm studying, and I'm learning. And God began to talk to me because I needed help, and I had some questions. And I prayed, and God spoke, and he said, hook your TV antenna to the back of your stereo. I hooked it up, turned it on, heard Kenneth e. Hagin talking about the authority of the believer. And I started right then ordering his books, ordering his tapes, learning how to walk by faith, and how to obtain the blessing of the Lord. I wanted the blessing of the Lord more than anything. How many of you want the blessing of God? Yes, Let me tell you something. You've got to want the blessing of the Lord so bad you can taste it. You dream about it. You wake up in the middle of the night, all night long last night. It was like I was in this, I don't even know what you call it. It was, I, it was somewhere between conscious and unconscious. All night long, the blessing of the Lord. God talking to me about the blessing of the Lord. Oh, my goodness, you've got to want this so badly. You got to want it more than you want your next meal. You got to want it more than you want your next breath. You got to want the blessing of God. You got to want it, kind of like Ken Copa said that time about the anointing. He said, I'd rather have the anointing than the world with a fence around it. Listen to me. Because with the anointing, you can get everything. But the devil offers it to you, guess what? There's a lot of sorrow. There's a whole lot of sorrow involved. Amen? Amen? Now, for those of you that are taking notes, I want you to write this down, okay? I read Malachi 3.10. God says, I'm gonna pour you out a blessing, right? Why does he do it? So you can be a blessing. Yes. How many of you want to be a blessing? Yes. Come on now. Yes. Do you really want to be a blessing? Yes. Because we tithe and we give. Yeah. We tithe regularly, we give regularly, we sow offers, we sow our seed regularly. I'm in a meeting last week with Mark Hankins. I sow a seed in the offering. There's a couple sitting to my right, got four or five children. God said, I want you to give that woman $100. So as soon as the service was over, I went down there, told her husband. I said, I hope it's okay. God told me to do something. He said, sure, go ahead. So I, I said, I told his wife, I said, Lord told me to give you this $100. And well, walked off. Went to the restaurant. Tip the waitress a hundred dollars. I mean, this is something. This is my wife, and this is our way of life. This is our way of life. Yep. Now there were times when we couldn't do anything like that. There were times when I was sitting there saying, "Lord, I want to." I found notes when you and I were in the meeting in Alabama in two thousand five, I believe it was. And Ross Roberts was preaching one of the services and then he came over here and preached. And I found the notes. And I was like, my goodness. I actually took her pad. I got one of your pages, the notes. I don't know where the rest of yours are. I got all mine and one of your pages. And one of I got reason I have one of her pages in, in my notes because I took her pad and I wrote, the Lord told me to sow $1,000. And she was in agreement. She said something back and she was in agreement. She had a checkbook in her purse, wrote the check. And that's when God spoke to us. Immediately after that, immediately after that, we sowed that $1,000. God spoke to both of us. Isn't that something, how God speaks to you after you sow the seed? Because, see, she's always so in tune with what God is saying. I thought I had something on her because God spoke to me and he said, prepare to travel. And so as soon as the service, morning service was over, we sowed that $1,000 at the end of the service. We we're going to go get some lunch. We get to the car, and I'm thinking, I can't wait to tell her what God said because I've always, always pastored. I'd never done any travel, preaching outside the church I pastored. And so I'm thinking, I got something she doesn't know. And so as soon as we sit down, she said, God spoke to me. I said, what did he say? He said, you were about to start traveling. <laughs> going to still pastor, but about to start traveling. Folks, listen to me. I still to this day can't remember how it happened. It wasn't probably two weeks later. A pastor called me and asked me to come preach at his church. I preached at his church. We went and preached at his church. We came home. 
took the kids to Florida on vacation while we were in Florida, another pastor called and he said, so and so that you just preached for is a friend of mine, you don't know me, but he told me about the services y'all had and how it changed his church. He said, I wanna know how soon you can come to my church. I said, well, how soon do you want me? He said, I want you Sunday if you can. I mean, as quick as you can come. You see how God moved once we sowed the seed in obedience to him? But y'all have to remember something. Us sowing that $1,000 at that time, you talking about a breakthrough seed. Oh, my goodness. Everybody say breakthrough. breakthrough. My, my, my. Hold on, I got to skip something here. What time is it? Oh, Holly and Kelly, I hope y'all don't mind me talking about y'all this morning. I promise you it's all good. <laughs> See, a lot of people, they don't know. Because Holly and Kelly and Brandon and Rick and others in the church that are so prosperous, Quincy, Brandis, and others, I can't call everybody. There's a lot of you that God has prospered the work of your hands, okay? God has prospered Milton and Francine. God has prospered Joshua and Rebecca. I mean, God is, there's, there's people in our church that are so prosperous, y'all don't know because they don't talk about it. They don't brag about it. That's right. When you humble yourself before God, God says, I will exalt you. Amen? Amen? Amen. And see, I want to talk about it. <laughs> I, I, I want to be like Jesse. I want to talk about it. I want to tell everybody. See, y'all don't know this, but in the early 2000s, uh, the prophetess, Mary Frances Varallo, was here. While they were taking her back to the airport, I believe it was, or while they were with her at some point, she prophesied to both of them that they were to be quartermaster generals to supply the army of God. Well, if you Google that, it means the head of the army department in charge of the quartering and equipment of the troops in charge of supplying the troops. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. We're in the army of the Lord. Yes. Jesus is the captain of the angels' armies of heaven. Right. We're in the army of the Lord. We're not alone. We got help. Amen. But God said, I want you to supply the troops. Amen? Amen. Well, at the time she said that... Uh, you know, they said they, they understood the words, but they didn't realize the impact of what it could mean. That year, I don't know about you, Kelly, but that year, Holly made $10,000. Well, that's burning it up, ain't it? Whoa! No, you don't write home to mama about that. I made $10,000 this year. But guess what? She said, they never forgot the prophecy, even though there was years that it didn't, they didn't look successful. The scripture was 1 Timothy 1, 18 that they stood on. This charge I committed to thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which, which before on you, that you by them might war a good warfare. Amen? Amen. Now, so, holding on to that prophecy, uh, Holly and Kelly, they uh, became business partners and uh, they tried some different things and none of it took off, but God kept dealing with them about being abstractors. And so, uh, Holly had got a job working in, in Charlotte, making 40,000 a year. Well, that's pretty good, you know, as a salary. But she just didn't like the environment. She knew that wasn't what God wanted for her long term. Kelly knew it as well. Kelly had a few uh, clients, but they just kept praying and seeking God. Holly said she learned, she saw things on a bigger scale uh, while she was working there, you know, a, a bigger way of doing things. Well, in June of 2012, she quit her job her and Kelly started Precision Title and um, they rented the office and they started you know, contacting different companies. Kelly had a few clients, like I said, but it really wasn't enough to support them and uh, they did pick up a couple more. 2013, they hired Caitlin, their first employee, and uh, it was a step of faith and they realized, they said in order to grow and to obtain more clients, they had to, have, uh, had to cover a larger area. Well, they would pay their bills and, you know, their only employee. And there was a lot of times that they hardly had any money left. Sometimes they'd get $200 a piece or $100 a piece, but they kept using their faith. They kept tithing. They kept sowing. Did I not tell you you have to start small? They didn't have a whole lot to sow, but how I many you understand? 
Well, you only make $200 that week and you just tithe 20 of it and you got bills to pay a $20 or $50. That's a mega seed right there. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So anyway, uh, God blessed them with some more clients. They hired another employee. By the end of the year, uh, they were wide open. Matter of fact, by the end of that year, 2013, uh, man, they were tearing it up. I thought, boy, this is really good, but I hadn't seen anything, and they hadn't seen anything yet. 2014, uh, Andrew, he quit his job and uh, teaches school and went to work for free. That's a step of faith. You know, because they had to have somebody handle the bookkeeping, receipts, payable and receivable and all that stuff. And so they kept praying about the increase and God uh, impressed on uh, uh, Holly and Kelly. This is what I'm about to say, business folks. God impressed them. Everybody say it out loud. They were already tithing. They were already tithing. They were already giving. They were already giving. Now God impressed upon them to make him their business partner and to tithe off the top of the business. Now here's what most business people do. Most business people, and when I started preaching this way back, people actually said that's not feasible. That's not doable. That's not practical. You can't do that. Well, they proved those people wrong. Amen. Okay? Listen to me. Most people who own a business, they pay their employees, they pay their bills, and they pay themselves a salary. Then they, if they pay themselves $500 that week, they will put everything else in the bank, but they pay themselves $500, so they rationalize, my tie is $50, and whatever I sow, I sow. But that's not what they started doing. They started tithing off the top. That's before paying the bills, before paying the employees. This is what we call putting God first, entering into partnership with God. Now, uh, Andrew got an idea. Believe it or not, once in a while, Andrew gets a good idea. <laughs> now, he's a very smart man. And he's praying, he, he listened to the Lord. And so he got this idea to cut costs by giving up the offices, setting up the employees to work from home. 2014, again, the business increased by a lot. 2015, uh, they had a whole lot of small companies, but only a handful of the major uh, companies, you know. And that's what they were praying for, for some of the major uh, companies to become their clients. And so up to that point, they had not been able to get their foot in the door. They'd done everything they could. But then they started tithing off the top of the business, and once they started doing that, they felt led to reach out to these companies again. And so Kelly was emailing, and uh, she got this email from these people, got a response, but no promise, but just a response, and uh, that they may you know, give them an opportunity, no promises whatsoever. Well, then Kelly and uh, Holly felt led to sow a breakthrough seed into someone else's business. Someone else who already had a successful business. Can I help some of y'all right here? A lot of people think when they sow a seed and they give, you ought to look around for somebody that's broke and poor. Well, let me tell you something. When you give to the poor, God repay it, but there's no increase and no multiplication in that whatsoever. You hear what I said? When you sow seed in faith, you want to find some good ground to sow it into. So they found someone that they knew who was a believer who had a successful business already unknown to them. When they sowed this big seed into his life, he told them it came at the exact needed time. See, because he didn't whine and grumble and complain, nobody knew that he had a need at the moment, and God came through. Amen? God moved on their heart and they sowed that seed. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, let me speed this up because I know it's getting late. March 2015, the company they were wanting to contract contacted them. They said, we're going to give you a trial run. It takes weeks just to try you out. But guess what? Within one week, they were doing all the work in the whole state of North Carolina for that company. And their, straight, their faith was now stretched like never before because they had to have more employees, had to set up, you know, more equipment. And by the end of 2015, they had hit a goal that only their faith could see it years before. Mm, my, my, my. And since then, 
They've been prophesied to just last year that the business would double again. Hallelujah. Now listen, 2 Chronicles 20, 20 says, we believe and trust in the Lord. We trust and act on his word and we trust his promise and it has led to our success. That was the scripture. That's not what it says, but that's the scripture, one of the scriptures they were standing on. Amen. Believe the Lord your God. You'll be established. Believe his promise and you'll prosper. Amen? Amen. 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 Do you believe? Yes. Do you believe what the prophets had said? Yes. The prophets talk constantly about the covenant of increase. Don't forget, this woman released her faith through her word. I want you to release your faith. I'm going to challenge you to do it right now. I want you to think about your life. What is your greatest need right now? What is your greatest need? You know, one of the things I love about Brother Jerry Savelle, one of the things I love about Jerry, he is so simple. I would encourage y'all to go online, listen to some of his teaching and order some of his books. Brother Jerry is a lot like Brother Hagin. He tells a lot of stories. He makes everything so simple, so easy to read, so easy to listen to, so easy to, to understand what he's saying. But Brother Jerry made this statement one time. I'll never forget it. I heard him say it years ago, and it stuck in my spirit. He said, every time I talk to God about a need, he talks to me about a seed. You better write that down. Every time you talk to God about a need, if you're listening, he'll talk to you about a seed. Amen? It was a breakthrough seed that they sowed that brought something that they were needing and wanting into manifestation. Already tithing, already given, but a breakthrough seed. That year that Allie and I was at that count meeting and God said, so $1,000, that was a breakthrough seed for us. At that point, at that point in time, that was a breakthrough seed for us. You know why? Y'all listen to me. People need to learn this. People need to understand this. Never complain about somebody's harvest when you don't know anything about their seed. Yes, that's right. That's right. See, because I said, and the Lord just reminded me of something. Now, that was in 2005, 15 years ago, we sowed that, and it was a breakthrough seed for us at that time. But what you don't know is, go back way, way back before that, when I had a business of my own and we lived in, in, in the lake house and we had started going to a church that God had led us to and the pastor wanted to build on to start a children's ministry. She volunteered to start the children's ministry, but not only that, there was nowhere to have a children's ministry. So Pastor David was a good carpenter. He could draw things out. He drew out the plans himself and he said, we need, how much was it? 12 or 14. Four, maybe. It was 14,000. He needed $14,000. And as soon as he said that, in my spirit, me and her both, we both, we're going to give it. Yeah. We gave it just like that 14,000. But what did God say? God said, anyone who leaves mother, father, brother, sisters, houses, lands, for my sake, yeah. shall receive a hundredfold in this lifetime with persecution. Now, we got the persecution, and bless God, the rest of the promise is ours too. You hear what I'm saying to you? Now, they're going to talk about us when they see that house going up. They're going to talk about us. Amen? But I could care less. They don't know about the seed. They don't know about the sacrifice. People don't know about Kelly and, 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 and Holly's sacrifice. Matter of fact, if I'd have asked them, it's really not an ask them because they probably wouldn't want let me. I didn't ask them if I could do that. I want y'all to know that there's people in this church that have sacrificed. Amen. Y'all don't know the times. While we was at Bible school, after leaving all that behind in Georgia, the business, the family, and everything, and at Bible school with our children out there in Oklahoma, there were times, and our kids, they never, never knew. They never knew that we didn't have anything. Well, we made a game out of it. I'd come in, and I said, everybody go through the cushions. Go through the car seat, down the cushion, go through the couch, go all over the house, find all the change you can find, look in the drawer. We'd get a bunch of change together, and we'd go down to Brahms. We'd get ice cream. And we'd just laugh and tell jokes and have fun. They never knew that we didn't have any money. You know why? Because we had everything. 
We had everything by faith. We knew. We knew. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do you know why you can stand having done all to stand? Because you already know you got it. Amen. You're not worried about if it's going to come. Yeah. You're just waiting for it to come. Yeah. I'll never forget. It only happened one time. We went out there for me to go to school. Then the Lord said that she's to go. She didn't even tell me. She said, I didn't want to put an extra burden on you. I said, God said it. He'll provide. So the second year, she went. I sat out. Third year, we went to school together. Third year, we didn't have tuition one month. She stayed home. I went. We had paid mine, had not paid hers. I'm talking about the first day this happened. Not a week later, two weeks later. The morning that she stayed home because her tuition was not paid. Pastor David and Betty called from Georgia. She answered the phone. You know what he asked her? What are you doing home? Is that not funny? What if I called Milton this afternoon, he answered the phone, I said, Milton, what are you doing home? What did he think? That's, are you crazy? You call me. What do you mean, why am I doing home? This is where I live. No, 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 no. Listen to me. He said, the Lord told me to call. He said, your tuition is already paid. He didn't even ask her why, what's going on or nothing like that. He said, I already know. He said, God told me. He said, I've already called over to the school. Your tuition paid. You can go back to school in the morning. Because I'm going to tell you all right now, if God can't provide, I'm going fishing. You hear what I'm saying? But my God is a provider. And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Do you believe it? Stand up and give the Lord a shout right now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Now, if you want to accept what I've talked to you about today, I'm going to give you a challenge. Kind of like giving people an opportunity to accept Christ as their Savior. But instead of that, I want to lead you into a prayer for those that believe and will receive it and you want it and desire it to enter into this covenant of prosperity and blessing with God. So for those that want to, repeat after me. Lift one hand to heaven right now. Say it out loud. Father God, I thank you for your holy word. I believe with all my heart. You spoke to Abraham long ago. You promised to bless him, him. and all his descendants. And, his descendants. and through his seed, and through his seed Jesus, Christ was born. Jesus Christ was born. I belong, I belong to, the Lord Jesus Christ. to the Lord Jesus Christ. And according to your word, to your word I, am an heir. I am an heir. I am the seed of Abraham. I am the, seed of Abraham. The, promise, the promise, the covenant, the covenant of blessing, blessing, of prosperity, prosperity. of supernatural increase. It is mine. It is mine. Jesus, has me Jesus has redeemed me from the curse of the law. The of the law. I, am I am redeemed from spiritual death, from spiritual death sickness, and disease, sickness and disease, from poverty and lack. From poverty and lack. This, day, this day, with my heart, with my heart I, believe I believe that Jesus, that Jesus provided, for provided for me the covenant, the covenant of, Abraham. of Abraham. Through his blood, Through his blood it's, been made it's been made possible for me to have everything that Abraham had. I have the life of God, the blessing of God. I have supernatural increase. I enter into this covenant by faith in the Lord Jesus and his blood. I believe your word. I accept your word. I agree with heaven. This day, I promise I make a commitment to you to bring the tithe, the tenth, all, the tenth of all. Everything I have, everything I have comes from you. Comes from you. The, earth the earth is yours, Lord, and the fullness thereof. The fullness thereof. You, own the you own the silver, the gold, the, gold, the cattle, and a thousand hills. Cattle, a thousand it, all it all is yours. You brought me out, brought me out of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of darkness. Into, into the kingdom of, the kingdom of your son, the, of your the, son, Lord, Jesus the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, I am an heir of Almighty God. I am a joint heir 
with the Lord Jesus Christ. All that he has is mine. All that I have is his. The Lord is for the body and the body is for the Lord. I am one with you, Lord. I surrender to you. I submit to you. I desire to learn the laws of your kingdom. I thank you, Father, for giving me understanding of the law of the tithe, the law of seed time and harvest. I believe and receive the word of the Lord through the prophet that you will bring supernatural increase to the faithful ones who will believe like never before. I receive it. I yield all to you. Bless the work of my hands. Increase me more and more. I ask you, Father, bless me so I can be a blessing. Your blessing makes me rich. Add no sorrow to it. So I yield to you. I'm listening to you. I know your voice. I'm led by your Holy Spirit. I believe that you will give to me visions or dreams, ideas, new concepts, new doors, opportunities, promotions. They are mine. I believe I receive it. And this day forward, I choose to walk in the covenant of supernatural increase. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God, glory. You ought to go home and write it down somewhere so you can look at it on a regular basis. This day I entered into covenant with Almighty God for supernatural increase.